We've got a lot of things to talk about, so I'll get started. I hope you all are having a good day. First off, I want to talk to you about a murder that occurred of a homeless man. He was not only a homeless man, but he was an operator. He worked his way around in the area. He met people in other homeless camps. He would, he had a system in place. And he would just go throughout the community ripping off people wherever he could. He happened to meet up with a Christopher Taylor and a Christina Sluss who had just come here from South Carolina and he said, hey, I got a system. You got a car? We're good. You drive me to the bank. I open up an account. I get a debit card. And then we'll go to an ATM, withdraw the money, and we'll have cash. And we'll rip off the banks. Well, they did this over a period of time. But he got to be a nuisance. And he got to aggravating Christopher Taylor. And he came by on a Saturday morning. And we got to go to the bank. We got to go to the bank. We got to go to the bank. And Christopher just had a short temper, and he had enough. So our Christopher Taylor here started to beat the victim. He, uh, he beat the victim first with a frying pan. And apparently he broke the handle of the frying pan, and this was in the city of Winter Haven, as I'll get to in a minute. He beat the victim with a frying pan, and that broke, and he beat the victim with another frying pan. And then he tells his girlfriend, Christina, hey, go downstairs and get Gary, my brother, and tell him to bring me the bat. So Christina goes downstairs, tells Gary, Christopher wants the bat. And he started to beat our victim with the bat. Chris beating and beating and our victim passed out. Well, then he comes to, and he begs Christopher, please don't beat me anymore. Please let me go. Well, that didn't work so well, so they started beating him and beating him and beating him some more. Oh, by the way, did I tell you that he had Christina turn on some music, some music to beat the victim by? It's ICP, Insane Clown Posse. So now we have music to beat the victim by, and he beats the victim unconscious again. When he comes through, he's screaming and crying and hollering, I didn't mean to make you mad. I didn't mean to hurt you. Please, let me go. Let me go. Gary has to talk to one of the neighbors and say, Hey, don't worry. It's just Chris and his girlfriend fighting downstairs. Well, in fact, what it was was our victim screaming and screaming and screaming. Well, the victim tries to leave the house. Christopher tackles him and then begins to choke him. And he chokes him unconscious. And he starts gurgling, according to Christina. And he stops moving. Well, immediately, the, they, the three of them, to include Gary, put, it, put our victim in, in garbage bags. And they put him in the, in the uh, bathtub. Well, what's interesting about that is, well, you know, it's, it's been a hard, hard day's work. Because they estimate that Christopher beat this guy for between an hour and a half and two hours. So they put him in the garbage bags and threw him over into the bathtub. And guess what? Then they all three went to Christopher and Gary's parents' house to have dinner. So they all had a good dinner together. Then Christopher says, hey, it's dark. Let's Google and find a place to dump the victim just outside of Polk County. 
the Google and found out that Bowling Green was outside of Polk County. So they drive him to the old Bowling Green Road and turn off on the old Bowling Green Road and dump the body. Uh, they made a tactical error. They dumped him in Polk County. And that's where we found him pursuant to a grove worker who was working in a grove. Have I told you lately that my homicide team is the absolute best in the entire nation. So now we have a person who, by the way, has a severed right hand and is cut up and beat up with no identification. Our homicide team identifies him. Not only do they identify him, they're able to find out that he owns a bicycle. And they work through their sources and through people in the community that once again cooperated and trust us and gave us information. And voila, we found the bike. It was behind Christopher and Christina's house or their apartment. They live in apartment A at 1830 Avenue O Southwest. And of course, they tell lies about that. Christopher ultimately gets arrested for lying during a capital crime investigation, and he's out of the picture. And now we're dealing with Gary and Christina. Gary and Christina finally confess to us. They confess that Christopher spent an hour and a half to two hours killing our victim. Guess what? When we seized their car, and hear me out, our victim's missing his right hand. What do we find on the car but a zombie sticker with no right arm? We're told that what the three of them did was watched horror movies nonstop. Gary Taylor is from Winter Haven. Christopher and Christina just came from another state. Gary has not been with Christopher and Christina, but he makes the statement, another one bites the dust. We suspect them of committing more murders in the United States and we're not saying any more now stand by for news well I have to talk about DeAndre Coffer he's smoking marijuana you know that harmless drug that nonviolent drug he's smoking marijuana just before he beats his girlfriend to death. And what is the horrible tragedy that Kiera Butler, his girlfriend, does, who's 32? She is reading DeAndre's three-year-old a book and trying to teach him to count and say apple when all of a sudden he screams at her you stop reading that voodoo book to my kid. And he sends the three-year-old out of the room. As soon as he sends the three-year-old out of the room, he begins to beat Kiera. And he beats her. And he beats her. And he beats her. And then he chokes her. And then he chokes her. And then he grabs the three-year-old and the infant leaves, goes down the street, a neighbor sees that his hand's all bloody and says, and he, he eventually called 911, or the neighbor called 911 and he took the phone. I don't have the details. But he makes the statement, I beat her. I told her not to read that voodoo to my kids. And I don't know if she's dead or not. Well, let me tell you, it was not a voodoo book. 
It was a child's prayer book. And Kiera was doing what a good mother would. She was reading to the three-year-old from a child's prayer book, and on this particular page, there was an apple tree with nine apples. And she was simply trying to teach the child in the bedroom, up in the bed, like good mothers would, how to read and how to count apples. And she's dead today. She's cur currently be Andrew's charged with second degree murder, but we're going to be talking to the state attorney's office later at the con conclusion of the investigation. But he absolutely beat her to death. Okay. Are you interested in the softball coach? All right. Billy Ray No is 33 years of age. And he works in Winter Haven, as I understand, but he's also hired by the school board to be an assistant softball coach at Frostproof. One of his previous players, when he also coached travel softball, was our victim. Billy Ray was also a friend of her daddy. And a group of people went to a concert to include Billy No and the girl and a couple of other people. And after the other people were taken home, Billy No engaged the 17-year-old child in sexual conduct. In our society, our civilized society, an adult cannot have sex with a child. Billy Ray, obviously, has not learned that. And as a result, he was arrested and placed in the county jail. And that's where he is today, unless he's made bond. Okay. Anything else? Do you believe there's more victims with him? I mean, obviously, he's been coaching a traveling team. He's been coaching a golf I, d I don't know. Billy Ray No has coached softball, and as I understand, is a good softball coach and has coached for some period of time. We want to know if there are other victims. I can tell you, if he's willing to have sex with one child, that's under the age of 18. Certainly he may be willing to have sex with other children under the age of 18, and that's what we want to know, if there's any other victims. I hope not. Maybe so. Anything else for today? Uh, can you kind of address some of the stuff you talked about yesterday in terms of uh, the, the school shooting in Parkland? What would you like to know? Uh, I guess first, I know you have the Sentinel program here. What, what do you think is, is you know, the solution after an event like this, especially now that it's so close to here? You know, my heart breaks for those 17 children that died as a result of a vicious, mad killer that went on to that school campus. The Florida legislature is in session and, as I understand, certainly has an interest in modifying the laws and the Florida legislature and the governor needs your support right now. There's no one answer to this issue, but there certainly is processes and protocols that can reduce the probabilities of an event occurring. And if an event occurs, as horrific as it is, there are systems and processes we can put in place to either eliminate or mitigate the damage. Certainly, there needs to be more teacher training, more hardening of the targets, the schools. There needs to be stronger teeth in the Baker Act, the Mental Health Evaluation System,
currently the law says if we somebody think someone is a threat to themselves or others, then we can pick them up, take them to a receiving facility to where they can be held up to 72 hours for mental health evaluation. That's not enough. As we have seen in the past around this state and around this nation, we can see some very frightening writings, some very frightening photographs, some very frightening uh, text, but it doesn't rise to the level of a threat. And if we hear about this and we go there, we're not able to do an intervention with an arrest or a mental health, the Baker Act, if they don't show that they're an imminent threat to themselves or others. We need more teeth in the Baker Act. So when we find these people that we're really worried about, we can get them the help up front. That's important. But for, us, for the sake of argument, let's look at where we are now. There are interventions. There is training. There is hardening of some of the schools. And we talked about how those things need to be improved upon. But the question is, what do we do when the active shooter shows up? And what I'm suggesting to you is not something that we want to do, but something we have to do. And here's what we have already done in this county with our Sentinel program, and I'm not suggesting that's the only program. We know, the data tells us, that when the crazed madman arrives on campus with a gun, with murder in his eyes, that the deed is usually completed within two to five minutes. And in Broward County, it was three minutes. We know that the police response is going to be a plus five minutes. 911 doesn't work. When we get the 911 call, the shooter is there committing the evil deed. So, what do we do? One solution is that you go to the school staff and you seek out those that will agree to be sentinels on the campus and call them what you want, guardians on the campus that will protect the children. You select them, you provide detailed background investigations, you provide detailed psychological evaluations, then you give them training like we do in our program. We require more firearms hours of training than even the police academy requires for you to be a certified police officer in Florida. We require them to, to train and qualify at a higher percentage than even the police academy standards in the state of Florida require. Then you allow them to carry a concealed firearm. And you don't have one, and you don't have two, but you have three, four, five on the campus. So God forbid that horrible day ever occur, that you have a group of people armed with guns that run to the threat to neutralize it before they harm our children, ideally, or even if their shooting stop, starts, you mitigate it. Now, oh, I hear some that go, oh, we don't want to do that. Well, okay, Einstein, you got a better idea? Do you have a better idea of how to stop a crazed, mad person armed with a gun, charging a campus with the plan in place to kill children? Well, no. They got an opinion. They run their mouth, talks cheap. I got a plan. The Florida legislature is concerned. 
I talked to the governor. He's concerned and is working toward a solution. I talked to several legislators. They are going to put forth solutions. The Sentinel program, as we have it, is not the complete plan. The Sentinel program is the last best solution when the shooter shows up, when everything else has failed. And I ask you this. For me, it's not a heavy lift. What would you want to happen if your child was in the line of fire? Would you want a teacher that was very well selected and trained to have a gun to protect your child? Or a janitor? Or a school administrator? Or a deputy sheriff? Or a police officer? You don't care. I don't care. My grandbabies are on these campuses. And your children are on these campuses. And your grandchildren are on these campuses. And we have an obligation to protect them. There's going to be another active shooter on a school campus, whether that's elementary, junior, uh, middle school, high school, or college. There's going to be another one someplace in this country. And Florida has the ability to show the leadership to show that we are willing to take the responsibility for looking out for the best interests of our children. Ladies and gentlemen, it would be a horrible day to have a shootout with an active shooter on one of our campuses with our children running around. It would be a worse day for the active shooter to be able to shoot and kill and shoot and kill and we're not able to protect the children. And that's where we are right now. I don't want to hear about all this rhetoric about gun control. That's another argument for another day. We have gun control on the campuses in the state of Florida. It says nobody possesses a gun except a law enforcement officer. That's gun control. How did that work in Broward County? It didn't because only the good people didn't have a gun on the campus that day. Only the law-abiding people didn't have a gun on the campus that day. The criminal's going to show up with a gun, whether he buys it legally or he steals it or he buys it off of the street. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of guns in this country. So let's save the gun control argument for another day, and let's focus on what we're going to do today when everything else fails to protect our children and keep them from dying. And that's whether it's at a school, in a business, in a church. Do you know, in a church, in a business, we're good to go because business people can allow guns and train. Churches can allow guns and train. I have, I have authorized my team, which is simply the best in the nation, since the shooting in Texas at the church, we've probably trained between 500 and 1,000 people and prepped them to protect their church or their business. So while you can protect your church, you can protect your business, you can protect your home, you can't protect your schools. That's pretty crazy. It's up to us to act. I have the program in place. Southeastern College is on board. We are working with and signing the contracts for another private college. And I've had several private schools call me and say, how do we do this? It's time for all the people in the state of Florida to say, okay, we'll have the we'll have the other discussions later, but let's give the law enforcement officers the Baker Act tools when we suspect somebody can be dangerous to get them help. 
and then let's have a program, a Sentinel program, so that we can keep the kids safe or do our best to protect the kids when all else fails. Any other questions? Sure. I'm not talking about that today. Um, I just, you know, came back from Balfour County. I spoke to survivors, families of the victims, and, and people, you know, community leaders. They're denying gun control, and they say that that could be a way to prevent this type of, you know, events from happening again. So even the sheriff Scott Israel uh, said that during an event that was held on Thursday night. So what's your position on gun control? I think I made my position perfectly clear. There's gun control today at the schools in Florida. How did that work? It didn't. We need a series of things we can do that I outlined earlier, but when all of that fails, we must be able to protect our children. Are these Sentinels going to be armed with AR-15s? We don't sit, discuss security measures that we will use, but I can assure you that we will, we will make sure that our Sentinels can run to stand in the gap. I mean, we've got coaches that ran to stand in the gap with no guns. Why not give them a fighting chance to protect the students? It's easy to run onto a campus when you know nobody's got a gun here but me. But when they run onto that campus with that wild look in their eyes and that gun of whatever description, and all of a sudden there's three or four or five people laying it to them, it's a game changer. Now they're on the defense instead of the offense. And folks, it just stands to reason. I submit to you, there is not, maybe, there, I, I submit to you that the overwhelming number of parents, if they could wind the clock back, and we can say, we'll hand you a gun here because there's an active shooter coming in 30 minutes. They, do you want this gun to protect your kids? Show me a parent who wouldn't have taken advantage of that if we couldn't get police officers there to protect them first. This is not rocket science, but it's much more important than that. And I hope and pray it never happens again. But if you want to reduce the probabilities, let the active shooter know that four or five or six or seven people are going to run out of classrooms and administrative buildings and lunch rooms with a gun and start shooting at you when you show up with your gun. It's a game changer. I promise you. You start shooting somebody, it modifies their behavior that quick. We'll even have them apologizing for ever showing up with a gun by the time we get the first three or four rounds in them. We'll have a game changer if we'll just protect our children. And listen to me clearly. Don't turn those cameras off yet. This is selected, vetted people who pass backgrounds psychologicals and have in-depth training that meets and exceeds the Florida police officer standards today. This is not anyone who wants a gun on a campus. This is special people for dangerous times. Go ahead, raise your hand. Which one of you who has a child on a school campus doesn't want somebody there with a gun to protect your baby. Any of you want to leave your baby's life up to whether or not the active shooter gets to him and shoots him? Any of you? I don't see any hands. 
All we have to do is approach this as how do we want our babies protected? And then we can have the gun control debate and all of that later on. We can have that discussion next month. But what are we going to do today? Is that all the questions? I got plenty more answers. But it's along the same lines as the one I just gave you. Thank you very much. Have a good day.